Well, good afternoon. I hope you had a good Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon and are ready for this period of Bible study. Uh, let me just remind you kind of the reason we're doing this and give you a little bit of information about our Sunday evenings. Um, the, the plan eventually is to live stream our Sunday uh, evening uh, Bible study in the auditorium. Uh, they wanted to take this week just to make sure everything was ready uh, for a live stream as far as the practical matters of where they're sitting and all that kind of thing. So if everything works out well, we'll be live streaming that next Sunday evening. And each time that we have Bible class, uh, we'll be doing it that way. And um, our adults are divided into three discussion groups. Uh, I'm teaching the teenagers, and I'm looking forward to that. And we're using the um, workbook by Willard Conchin. Uh, this is a systematic study through, this is James through Jude. This quarter, we're limiting that to the book of James. And um, if you do not have a workbook, we have those, and you can get one, just let us know if you need one, and we'll, we'll be getting that to you. As I mentioned this quarter, we're looking at the book of James. And as we do so, there are just a few things that I think we need to, to recognize and keep in mind. One is that the Bible itself is the textbook. This workbook is a great workbook, uh, but it's really not the textbook. In fact, uh, Brother Conscient himself, as he wrote this, mentioned in his foreword that... Um, like any other teaching device, the workbook is best used when the student and the teacher do not lean too heavily upon it. And what he recommended was study the book or study the Bible, whatever book of the Bible that we are studying, in this case, the book of James. Study it thoroughly before you go to the workbook. And I think that's, that's a good recommendation. And so it's simply a supplement to your study. Uh, I think another phrase that Brother Conchin used in the workbook is that it is a review book. So you study the Bible, you study the text itself, and then you go to the workbook. And I th think you'll definitely get more out of it by doing that. And of course, there are other resources that can be used as well. Uh, first thing probably that comes to people's mind are commentaries. And there's not a thing wrong with commentaries. I use the uh, commentary by uh, Guy N. Woods. It's in the Gospel Advocate series, and we have these in our church library as well. I used this uh, last year when we went through the book of James uh, as I was preaching from the book of James. I used it uh, quite often. But remember, commentaries are written by human beings. Uh, I have the greatest respect for Guy N. Woods. I heard him preach when I was younger, and uh, I've read and used his materials extensively, and he was a fascinating and an amazing student of the Bible. But like everybody else, he's human, and any commentary is produced by a human being, and therefore there are possibility that there are things in it that are wrong. Um, and so don't be too dependent upon commentaries is the reason I say that. You can use them. They can be helpful, uh, but recognize their limitations. Uh, one of the greatest uh, resources in a, in a Bible study is a concordance. And of course, uh, those of us who are old timers, we remember the big, heavy uh, commentaries, or, or, or concordances rather, that you have to sift through. Of course, today you have all of that on computer, on your phone, uh, any type of electronic device like that can have a Bible app. It has a concordance in it. You type in the, the word or the phrase. And one of the great things about having it electronically is it's not just a word, but you can type series of words and look up verses that have all of those words, or you can have a phrase. A lot of different ways you can do that. But that's a wonderful way of supplementing your study of a passage. Uh, again, those of us who are older probably remember teachers talking about running references. And the idea is you take your concordance and a particular word 
or theme, and you just run references that have uh, that word or that theme, and you build uh, your, your study around that. And that's certainly a wonderful way of studying. And as we study the book of James, we can do that. We can take the theme, take the word, and then look at other passages that have that same idea. Uh, I use on my computer eSword, and I recommend it. Uh, it, it is a free resource. In fact, I think everything I have on my computer with eSword is free. Uh, commentaries, dictionaries, all of those different things that, that you can use. And obviously, they're very helpful. And, um, and so uh, those, those are some, some resources that you can use. Now, in addition to that, uh, this past week, I just got online and typed in uh, a search engine on the internet. Uh, Book of James, Church of Christ, because I wanted to look and see what brethren have on the book of James. And I found a, a number of things that I had not seen before. I did that back when I preached from James, uh, but now I'm looking at it again and I'm finding other resources. And so those can be helpful things as well. And I found, uh, in fact, Chris Adcock mentioned uh, somebody uh, had a particular lesson I was not familiar with it. I found it while I was looking at that. And so there are a lot of different things, church websites. You can find sermons. You can find Bible classes, a lot of information. And again, uh, we provide PTP 365 for the congregation. I did not find anything on the book of James uh, on that, but obviously there are um, a lot of reference, uh, reference materials, a lot of things that can be used there. And it's other things are being added to it. So you look back occasionally, you might find something there as well. But those are some things that can be used as you begin a study of the book of James. Now, let me mention just one thing that I'm going to encourage the teenagers to do. Now, I realize uh, as I'm doing this, I'm probably talking to people who have studied the Bible as long as I've been alive, some of you. And so you've already got a method that you use and if it's worked for you, you don't need to change it. But let me tell you what I'm going to tell our young people, and then I'll tell you the reason why. I'm going to encourage them to read the book of James all the way through in one sitting. Now, it took me, I timed myself doing this yesterday. It took me about 11 minutes to read the book of James. And I read it out loud so that I would not be, you know how if you read silently, you can read a little faster I read it out loud just to make sure that um, I was was giving the time that would, would actually take. 11 minutes to read something is not that long. And obviously in this type of setting, it's, it's worthwhile. And so I'm going to encourage them to do that. And then as we study a particular chapter, I'm going to encourage them to read that chapter more than once. And of course, the reason for that, the more you read it, the more familiar you are with it, the more you see the connections within the text, and, and it simply helps you to be prepared uh, to, to understand what is in a passage and to be able to, uh, to discuss it. And as you read through it, of course, there are words perhaps not familiar. You, you won't stop and make sure you understand that word or that idea. Uh, if other passages come to mind, you go and read those as well. And one thing that's helpful is perhaps to keep a notebook. Um, as I study, I make notes. And uh, some people make notes in the margin of their Bible. I generally don't do that. And the reason I don't do that is because when I get up to preach, I want to be able to read. And if I've written something over, it may make it difficult to read. So normally I'll keep my notes elsewhere. But uh, keep a notebook. If you have a question about something, uh, something comes to your mind that you're not sure you understand. Write that down, and you'll be able to come back later and uh, and address that and perhaps find find the answer. If not, be able to ask somebody else to, to give you help. Um, and again, as you do those things, hold off answering the uh, questions in the workbook. Do all of that first, then go to your workbook and uh, and answer your question. And so uh, what we're doing this week is an introduction to the book of James, and I've added the first verse of the book to it because that kind of goes hand in hand with introductory materials. Now, 
a lot of times when we're studying the Bible, we omit introduction. Uh, a lot of times in, in maybe an auditorium class or a Bible class where we're studying from the book itself, uh, we'll just start verse 1 and, and go into the book and make an assumption that everything is, uh, uh, you know, good from that point on. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But um, a good background knowledge of the book that we're studying can be helpful. Uh, it will broaden our appreciation, strengthen our faith, because there, there are going to be times that you run into people who don't accept the Bible as from God. And it's good to understand why that's the case and to be able to at least give an answer to that. Um, as I approach the Bible, and I'm sure many of you are the same way, I say many, probably all of you, the same way, I believe this book is from God. I don't question that. And so as I open to the book of James, then it says, James, a servant of God. I don't question that James is the author. And I realize that there are people who do, um, and, and there are reasons that are given that I simply don't accept, but uh, it's good to understand that because you may have a coworker one day or a neighbor one day say, well, you know, I just, I just don't believe the Bible's from God. And to be able to discuss that and, and, and to be able to, to sit down with that person and say, well, here's, here's the reason I think it is from God uh, can be helpful perhaps in reaching that person. So when you talk about introduction, there are really two different ways of approaching it. There's the critical introduction, and, and that's what you'll find like in a college setting, and that's really not what we need to look into. But there's a practical introduction where you look at such things as who wrote the book, to whom did he write it, uh, what is the theme of the book, uh, a good uh, outline of the book. Regina found a book some time ago uh, the book is entitled Know Your Bible by Frank Dunn. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a thick book. It's almost uh, 400 and something pages, 600 and something pages. And, and what he does is he goes through the Bible, book by book, section by section, because there's sections on the, um, like the five different divisions of the Old Testament. And, and he just gives you a basic overview of those things. And in the book of James, he has uh, keys to the epistle, like key words, key verses, key phrases, uh, a background such as um, uh, where it fits within the New Testament, like it's the general epistles rather than written by Paul, uh, who wrote it, to whom it's written, that kind of thing. Then he gives you the main points of the chapter and some um, main uh, lessons. How does he describe that? Great messages from the book of James. And a book like this, um, can be helpful in giving you kind of an overview uh, understanding of the book itself. Uh, Halley's Handbook of the Bible is one that's been around forever, uh, does much the same thing. A, a good study Bible is going to have some of those same things in um, just at the beginning, just a very general and brief uh, overview to give you those things. Uh, in fact, the the King James Version that I preach from uh, has a little section. I don't know if you can see it right there, but it has a little section at the uh, at the beginning of each book that uh, gives you just some of the basic uh, theme and who wrote it and that kind of thing uh, as you begin the book. And that can be helpful as well. But you don't have to go into those things, but it can be helpful to... Uh, uh, to give you some background into understanding those things. So let's look at the book of James itself. And uh, one of the things that you note know really easily about the book of James is very practical. It talks about things about daily Christian living. It has been referred to as the Monday through Saturday religion. It has been called the gospel of common sense or the Christian book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of James describes a life of obedient faith. And um, one of the things that you'll see in the book that genuine faith in, in Jesus is always 
going to be evident in every area of our life. And the book of James speaks to that. It's not uh, where you divide your life into my, my Christian life and my other life. That, that's not going to fit in the book of James. It's going to show you that every area of life is affected by our faith. And so as we, as we begin a study of the book, understand you're going to be looking at practical things, things that will affect the way you live and the way you think each day. Um, when I preached through this back last year, I suggested a theme verse is chapter 1 and verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Um, and, and that's certainly a, a good theme, but back up just a few verses to verse 22 of chapter 1. And this verse says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. That may be a better theme verse. Because it emphasizes it's about doing, not just thinking, not just what we have in our mind, but how that is um, put into practice in daily life. And so uh, either of those can, can emphasize to us that our life as a Christian is to be lived. It's not just something that's in the mind. All right, so um, in the time we've got left, I want to look at three thoughts uh, as we introduce the book. First of all, who wrote it? To whom did he write it? And then for what purpose? And we kind of talked about purpose already, but we'll, we'll go back and do that again. As I read part of verse 1 earlier, it opens with the word James. He calls himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the name James occurs some 40 times in the New Testament. And there are at least three different people named James. And this one gives no further identification as to who he is. Obviously, he's a Christian, but beyond that, we don't know from the book who he is. Um, it appears, and this is a little bit um, uh, subjective, but it appears that he is well known enough that he doesn't have to say anything else. And that may give us some insight into who it is. The three major Jameses of the New Testament is, one, the brother of John, one of the apostles. But you remember from Acts, the 12th chapter, that he was put to death by Herod. And that's fairly early on and probably earlier than this book would have been written. So that would eliminate him as the author. There's also another apostle named James, the son of Alphaeus. In, in Mark chapter 15 and verse 40, he's called James the Less. That's all we know about him. In every instance of the listing of the apostles he's mentioned, he's found in Acts 1 and verse 13, where the, again the apostles are mentioned. Beyond that, we know nothing about him. Now, if this James is so well known, he doesn't have to tell people who he is, it's possible that he's not this one. That would leave one other James, and that's the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, he's mentioned in Mark, Matthew 13, verse 55, and Mark 6 and verse 3, along with his other brothers. He is, he is the James in uh, the book of Acts who is very prominent in the church at Jerusalem. In fact, he is called a pillar of, in the Jerusalem congregation by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 and verse 9. Now, if you remember, prior to the crucifixion and resurrection, the brothers of Jesus did not believe on him. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul mentions the fact of, of, of Jesus appearing to many different people uh, after the resurrection. And uh, James is one of them mentioned by name. And so here is one who did not believe on Jesus, but after his crucifixion and after his resurrection, he became a believer and in fact became a very influential member of the church uh, there in, in the city of Jerusalem uh, in Acts 15 when the apostles 
and the elders met together to discuss the question about the uh, Gentile converts, he takes a leading role. And uh, in Acts 21, when the Apostle Paul went back to Jerusalem to deliver the, um, uh, the collection that he gathered for those who were hurting, he went to James and the elders. In fact, um, in Galatians 1, in verse 19, Paul mentions a trip to Jerusalem that he saw none of the elders, or excuse me, none of the apostles except James, the brother of Jesus. Well, James, the brother of Jesus, was not an apostle. But as you look at what he's saying in Galatians 1, I didn't see important people there. I didn't see any of the apostles. The only person I saw of importance was James, the brother of Jesus. Again, that emphasizes his position in the church after that. A lot of times we talk about the change that took place in Saul of Tarsus. After he uh, saw the Lord on the way to Damascus, look at the change that's wrought in his life. Well, the same can be said of James, the Lord's half-brother. He was an unbeliever, but he became not just a believer, but a very influential Christian during the first century. And if this is the author of the book, uh, and that's generally what's accepted, uh, then it's probably written from the city of Jerusalem uh, to Christians who have been scattered. So let's move now from James, the author, to the people to whom he writes. And if you look again in verse number one, he writes to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, I mentioned Brother Wood's commentary, and he, he has an extensive discussion as to who is under consideration in the 12 tribes. And um, I just want to read his conclusion. This is in verse, or, or verse, it's in page 32 of his commentary. If you have the commentary, he writes it in italics. It's right in the middle of the page. He said, we conclude, therefore, that the book of James was written to Christians scattered throughout the world, whether Jewish or Gentile, among whom, of course, many descendants of Jacob. And the phrase, the 12 tribes, refers figuratively to the true Israel of God. And so, now you can, if you want to read that and go into it in more depth, you can do that. But the 12 tribes used in reference to not fleshly Israel, fleshly descendants of Jacob or Israel, but to the spiritual descendants and to the, um, and the number of passages in the New Testament. You can go and read, for example, Romans 2, 28 and 29. And he talks about the one who is a true Jew. It's not outward, but it's inward. And a number of passages like that. And Brother Woods uses those or, or gives you those in his commentary as well. And so the, the term 12 tribes of Israel used figuratively, not the literal descendants of Jacob or Israel, but those who are of faith. And, and the Bible does the same thing with Abraham. Uh, Romans 4 talks about the descendants of Abraham. You remember Jesus talking to uh, the Jewish people during his day. You, you say Abraham's your father. Well, if he was, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. I believe that's John 8. Uh, where, he do, where he talks to them that way. But also think about using that phrase as, as background because when, when you say the 12 tribes of Israel, you think immediately about God's people during the Old Testament. Well, there are many times God's people were scattered because of their sin, but many who were scattered were faithful to God. You think about Daniel in Babylon and people like that who were faithful to God and yet they suffered. And here are people suffering, and, and he'll talk about that in the book of James. And so perhaps it's a way of, he's, of him saying, you're not the first one to face this. You're not the first one to go through this. And so these people scattered in other places, perhaps they had to, to leave their homeland uh, and, and as a result of their faith. And so he's writing to them, in spite of that, here's the way that you can live. Now, other things you can look at, for example, James is a general epistle written not to a specific group of people or person, but to a, an extended group of people. 
And so um, think also about its purpose. And why was it written? Well, we've already described it as having to do with practical Christianity, Monday through Saturday religion, um, Christian book of Proverbs. The book of James explains how we can live out the principles of our faith in everyday life. Faith is not a church building thing. It has to do with how you live each day. And it's very much up to date. I mean, think about the book of James written almost 2,000 years ago. But it speaks to things that you're facing right now, things that you deal with on a daily basis. And, and of course, the Bible itself is that way. Every aspect of the Word of God speaks to and has something to do with how you live day by day. And so I encourage you, as we look at the book of James, as we study it through this quarter, keep those thoughts in mind. Recognize that it's a book that will help you and assist you as you try to live day by day. And um, I, I'm reminded of the words of George Bailey. Brother Bailey was a preacher out in Texas, passed away a few years ago, a uh, tremendous speaker uh, and uh, uh, preacher of the Word of God. And he said of the book of James, it can be read in a few minutes, but thought of for a lifetime. And again, it took me about 11 minutes yesterday to read the book through, and it's worth spending that 11 minutes doing that because these are things that will help you every day. Uh, and it also encouraged something else as we... Think about this type of study for a Sunday night class. Make it a daily activity. Don't wait till a Sunday afternoon or late Saturday night. Say, oh, I've got to get my workbook filled out. If that's all you're doing, you're not going to get much out of the class. It's not going to be helpful to you like it could be. But read every day. Study every day. Give thought. And the more you do that, you'll find that even without your Bible open in front of you, you've got it up here that you can give thought to it. So you're, you're driving somewhere by yourself or you're sitting and waiting for something and you can give thought to the book of James and it can be something uh, to help you. And so again, if you, um, if you don't have a workbook, let somebody know. We'll be sure to get one to you and that can be something you can use uh, to help supplement your study and give your time to the, to the word of God on a regular basis and it will be something that will benefit you. Let's close out our study with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we are thankful that you gave us your word and we're thankful that we have the opportunity to study it. Help us as we prepare to open the book of James and, and read it and study it and help our study to benefit our lives. Help us to look for things in that book that will make a difference in the way we live day by day. We pray that you'll bless our study, bless all of those who are involved in it, that we might gain much from it. And above all things, Father, thank you so much for Jesus who died for us. It's in his name that we pray, and amen. Thank you for joining me. I hope it's been beneficial to you. And again, let me encourage you, be daily students of the Word of God.